First, let me say how truly honored I am to receive this award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about cognition and assessing cognition older, undereducated individuals. Uh, this report is part of a larger study, an R01 uh, study, on cognition and untreated psychosis in China. And this study is aimed at identifying uh, people who've never been treated uh, uh, for schizophrenia and comparing cognition in them, comparing them to people who've received treatment and to match treated controls. And none of the investigators have any conflict of interest um, to report on this project. So the background of the project is following. Uh, China has a, a national registry system for people with severe mental disorders and uh, who are living in the community. And we use this registry system from two provinces to identify the subject for the study, one in Ningxia in the north part of China and another in Guangxi province in the south part of China. Uh, most of the identified patients with untreated schizophrenia were from rural parts of these uh, provinces. Uh, where there's less services and therefore you're more likely to find people who are untreated. Uh, however, we did an initial pilot study and identified several fairly important problems. Uh, we originally planned to use the standard Chinese version of the matrix, consensus cognitive battery, the MCCB, which is the most widely used cognitive battery for assessing cognition schizophrenia throughout the world. There's a Chinese version. However, most of the never treated individuals with schizophrenia were older, undereducated rural residents, a third had never attended school, who did not meet the age and education criteria used for co-norming sample of the standard Chinese nine-test version of MCCB. That, that version used people 20 to 60 years of age uh, who had at least five years of formal education. So a lot of the identified patients we had were all either over 60 or had less than five years of education. So these older, undereducated respondents often did not understand the requirements of the MCCB test after a single reading of the instructions. So the standard administration read this, the instruction in a special way, and then they start the test. But we did this for many of these subjects, and they didn't get it. Moreover, 90% of the respondents had never used a computer. So they couldn't use a computer mouse, which is required in the continuous performance test, one of the tests in the battery that assesses attention and vigilance. And and another issue was many of the respondents were unfamiliar with the social situations described in the MCCB test used to assess social cognition, the uh, managing emotions component of the uh, emotional intelligence test, the mesquite. And so there were already several problems uh, in administering this test to this cognitive assessment to many of our subjects. And in fact, this is a preliminary report. We now have, in this particular report, we'll talk about 134 matched triplets of untreated, that's never treated patients with schizophrenia, 134 treated controls, and 134 healthy controls. These are matched for age, schooling, gender, ethnicity, residence, and for the two patient groups, duration of illness. And as you can see, after we collected these 134 triplets, uh, which is total 402 subjects, about 45% of them met the criteria that have been used to assess cognition uh, in using MCB in China before, which is they were under 60 and had at least five years of education. But 55% were either over 60 or had less than five years of education. And so the question, what are we going to do with all the, you know, 55% of the patients identified, did we just drop them? Or how big of a problem is this that the MCB is just not, uh, as the, non, the standards used for MCB aren't relevant for these subjects? So our first question was, is this just a, a, a quirk because we're identifying untreated patients and, in fact, almost all people do meet the criteria, or there are a substantial number of people who don't meet these criteria? So what we did is we estimated the portion of persons with schizophrenia in different regions of the world that do not meet the age and education criteria used for in national standardization samples for the MCCB, which, as I said, is the most common method of assessing cognition in schizophrenia. And basically, this is based on the uh, prevalence of schizophrenia by age in different parts of the world, in all countries in the world, using the Global Burden of Disease Study for 2019, and then applying the country-specific educational uh, accomplishments in different age groups uh, uh, reported by the World Bank. So when you look at the total sample, you know, there's about 23 million people based on the Global Burden of Disease uh, sample, 23 million people with schizophrenia. And 
In high income countries, about 20% of them are over 60. So you already have one in five subjects who don't meet the criteria because the, in the US, for example, the normalization sample is 20 to 59. So we got 20% who don't uh, fit that criteria. Um, of course, in the uh, lower middle income countries, that's a smaller proportion who are over 60 because they're not as rapidly aging as the high income countries, but still is substantial. However, when you add those who have not completed elementary school in the 20 to 59 uh, year range, you get a slight increase in the high income countries, but the increase in the low and middle countries is quite substantial. In fact, in the lowest income countries, 50% of people with schizophrenia do not meet these criteria. Many of them have not completed elementary school. And so that's half of all the schizophrenics in the most uh, uh, backward countries in the world. And so that's a substantial number. And when you add this up globally, it comes to about 30%. If you slightly increase the requirements uh, of education, to say that have to finish primary school, but nothing beyond that, so they have maybe five or six years of education. If that's your criteria, then the numbers, of course, go up, and you get to, a, in the low-income countries, like 67% of the persons with schizophrenic wouldn't meet, couldn't be assessed using MCCB, and globally, it'd be 42%. So this is not a small problem. This is clearly not something just unique to our particular study. So it came clear that we need to make changes in administration of the MCCB if we wanted to use this instrument for these particular cohorts. First of all, there's the tests that are in the battery. In the English version, there's nine tests that cover seven different domains. And in the standard Chinese translated version, which is used in relatively urban, higher educated people generally, the one test was deleted, The uh, one of the working memory tests. The, um, number letter sequencing test uh, because, of course, the Chinese don't use the English alphabet. So that's been, that was removed from the original, the standard Chinese version. In addition to this, the changes we made in our Chinese revised version we see in red, one, we had to train people to use a mouse before the continuous performance test, which required them using a computer and a mouse. So we had to train them how to use a mouse. We also, for the reasoning and problem solving, the um, mazes, we added a training maze because these people hadn't used maze before. I had no idea what it was. And finally, in social cognition, many of the descriptions, as I said before, really weren't relevant to particular rural subjects. And so we all uh, changed the test that we used to set social cognition and use a revised Chinese version of reading the mind and the eyes test in our revised adapted version of the scale. So, for example, almost all the tests were done in people's homes, and this is how we trained them to use a mouse. We gave them a mouse and had them click on five points, and if they could do that, then they were considered trained. Um, the RMET, the reading the minds, the eye test, if people aren't familiar with it, it's basically show them eyes, and then they have to judge what the emotion is being expressed. And we actually had 70 slides, half were Asian and half were non-Asian. But that wasn't enough. There clearly also had to be changes in instruction and assessment of each test. Uh, the formal part of the test remained the same as in the original version. So when you're at the part, the actually score was exactly the same. We didn't change that. But test administrators repeated or rephased instru uh, rephrased instructions and practice examples for at least, uh, at least up to six times. The goal was to ensure the respondent understood the test expectations to the greatest extent possible before starting the main test. So you really want to be sure they knew what they had to do before they started. And that required multiple uh, explanations and sometimes kind of uh, rephrasing it for them. The three tests without practice examples, uh, verbal memory, visual memory, and animal memory, uh, animal uh, naming tests, respondents are asked to describe the test expectations before starting the formal test. So there's no uh, training, but to demonstrate that they actually knew what they were supposed to do, ask them to describe what we just uh, explained to them. The interview uses test-specific rules to classify the training outcome, that is, the degree to which respondent understands tasks before starting the formal test. So this is something new we've added. The um, interviewer has to make an assessment of this. And the interviewer also assesses when the test is over, the test status. That's the responsibility to complete the test. Uh, after we see what they've done. To do this all, we developed a revised administration manual, coding form, and criteria for valuing competency of interviews, training interviews, because this is much more difficult than the standard edition, 
takes five to seven days. Um, so this is the the scale. One of the we had two scales: the training outcome scale variable, and it's rated uh, on five points. A five means that you read it once and they get it, which is basically what is done in the original method of administering the MCCB. You read it once and they get it and they can do the test, so you don't have to do it again. A four is that you have to read it, do it a second time and they get it. A three is you have to do two to six times, but they finally get it. A two is no matter how much you explain it, they don't seem to understand what they're supposed to do. And a one is a refusal. But here, refusal is a little different. All these people sign consent forms, but when they get to a test that figures too difficult, often people say, ah, I don't want to do that. So the refusal often is a reflection of perceived inability to do the test rather than, say, rather than the sort of people who are really upset and refusing. So those are the five uh, measures for the training outcome. Um, we also have six measures for the test status variable. Um, and, and this, uh, sorry, I want to go back here, um, for the test status variable. Incomplete tests includes those who refuse to do the actual formal part of the test. Some people were unable to do the test because they simply didn't have the skills. For example, a small proportion didn't even recognize Arabic numbers. And so for the trails test, they got to connect one to 25 dots, and they don't recognize numbers, so clearly they can't do it. And others couldn't learn how to use a mouse. And some people, no matter how much you explained it, it was clear they really didn't understand what they were supposed to do. So these are all considered incomplete tests. Successfully completed tests included three situations. One in which um, they made no response at all, but it was clear that they knew what they were supposed to do. For example, you read the 12 words of the verbal learning test, and they're supposed to repeat them, and they say, I don't remember any. So it's clear they know what they're supposed to do, but they couldn't do it, and so you give them a baseline score with zero. Another situation is where they make an active response, but they don't get a score. For example, they do the mazes, but they can't finish them in time. So again, they get a basement score of zero. And finally, the six, they do the test, they get active response, and they get a score. So that's how we divide it, the test results. Um, these two variables were assessed by uh, all the interviewers, but to assess their, the test reliability, we had 125 tapes independently uh, tested by two blind raters to see how concordant the assessments were of these two variables. The training outcome variable, if you use the range of one to five, was the mean of the nine tests is 0.74. This is the COPPA value. If you excluded the refusals, it was 0.82, it's pretty good. The test status, kind of how you classify, is it incomplete or uh, successfully completed? If you use the one to six level, it's 0.94, very good. And if you just did dichotomously incomplete or successfully completed, it was 0.92, which is excellent. So it was reliable. Okay, so what are the results? Well, this is just a general description of the sample. This is a full sample, and then there's two subsamples. Remember, the educated younger sample, which have at least five years education and have been uh, and are under 60, and the undereducated under older subsample, which is over 60 or with less than five years of education. So the mean age is 49. Um, of course, it's older in the undereducated older sample, it's 52 versus 48. The mean years, of, uh, this is uh, median years of education is four from zero to seven. So that's really very low. Even those who met the criteria of the educated younger sample it was only seven years of education. Almost all studies in China, you have about 10 or 11 years. So even compared to the standard use of, of uh, this test in China, these are less educated. And in the undereducated group, it was like one year was the median year of education. And a lot had no education at all. Um, gender, about 60% were female. More of the undereducated were female, 71 versus 45%. 61% um, were Han, which means about 39% were ethnicity groups, ethnic groups. The mean duration of illness was 20 years, ranging from 3 to 50. We had people with 50 years of untreated schizophrenia in the sample. So that's sort of the general description of the sample. Our main one of our main questions was, does this additional training actually improve the outcome? Will you get more outcome? So this is looking at one of the tests, the mazes. And here, highlighted in green, we're comparing those who understand the task after a single reading, which is like in the standard administration, versus those who required multiple explanations. So like 45%, about 45% understood what was required after a single reading, and 55% required it more than one reading. Now, of those who one reading worked, 100% had a successful test at the end of the test who was successful. 
of the 55% who required multiple explanations, 86% had a successful test at the end. So that means there's 192 people here who, out of the 402, who probably in standard administration wouldn't have been able to complete the test. But with the additional uh, explanations, they were. And so that's really a substantial upgrade in the outcome of the test, given the additional um, explanations. Also, those who um, uh, understand the test in a single test, their MMSE, the mini mental status exam, is substantially better than those who require multiple tests, which is what one would expect. This is looking at that across all nine tests. These are the proportion in this column, the proportion who require multiple explanations, ranging from 76% uh, for the continued performance test, which is a computer test, it's really complicated, to 38% uh, for 38% uh, um, for visual, 38% uh, for visual learning. Of those, the proportion who had a successful test at the end ranged from 46% to 88%. Uh, so we're getting a lot of them who previously wouldn't have been able to complete with the additional training actually do work in all the tests. And for all the tests, the proportion of required multiple explanations was always highest in the untreated, intermediate and treated control, and lowest in the healthy control. This is now looking at all the tests uh, who successfully completed. It is all the successfully completed. Successful completed range from 73.1% uh, in reading in the, meeting the eyes to maize is 92%. So that means here you'd get about 27% uh, who didn't successfully complete the test, whereas in mazes you had like 8%. That, of course, varies across the group. In the healthy controls, there's a much higher proportion who successfully complete the test. Uh, and in all, uh, for all tests, success of completion is highest in the healthy control, intermediate in the treated control, and lowest in the untreated. If we divide this by the educated younger subsample, the undereducated older sample, you see in the healthy controls, 100% of people who have at least five years of education and are under 60 years of age who are healthy controls are able to successfully complete the tests. Now, this varies, for, but for the untreated, it's nowhere near as high, and the intermediate number is the treated control. In the undereducated older subsample, even some of the healthy controls uh, were unable to complete the test successfully. The lowest here was in the continuous performance. That's computer tests, like 16% of the healthy controls who were over 60 or had less than five years education were not able to successfully complete the test. But again, here, multiple comparisons were strong. The differences were stronger in the undereducated group. The differences across the three uh, subsamples, untreated, treated controls, healthy controls, was greater here than in the educated younger sample. Uh, so there, at a higher level of education, there's less discriminating the different groups. This is sort of a graphic of that, showing that um, the green line is the educated uh, younger, the middle line is the total sample, and the gold line is the uh, undereducated older. And you see in the healthy controls, there really isn't that much difference between the educated younger and the undereducated older. But in the untreated group, there's a big differential. Uh, and so in the untreated group, it really distinguishes uh, age and uh, age and education, really discriminates the, this is the, no, this, sorry, the, this graph is the number of tests that are successfully completed out of the nine tests. And the healthy controls, even if they're educated or not educated, they all are complete at least eight. Whereas in the untreated patients, the um, uh, undereducated older ones are from 6.4 to 4.5, whereas the uh, educated elder, educated younger are from like 7.3 to 8.5. So there's really a big discrimination uh, in the untreated group that is not seen in healthy controls by education. Uh, this slide just show compares the ones who have incomplete tests, this is for the um, trails making tests. It compares the minimum of status exam if it was incomplete versus com uh, successfully completed. Uh, and the social disability screening scale, so social dysfunction, and the PAN score. And here, for all groups, those who have um, incomplete tests, they have, uh, compared to those who have completed successfully completed tests, they have a lower minimum mental status exam, they have higher social dysfunction, and higher uh, symptom scores. And that's true across all groups. Why this is important is when you're doing analysis, 
So this is a, a slide of the animal naming test. So this is the total sample. Here's the untreated patients, and these are the incomplete tests. And this is the treated controls, this is the incomplete test, and the healthy controls. And you see there's a lot more um, incomplete tests in the untreated patients. But remember, these incomplete tests are people who are most severely disabled. And so if you only look at those who successfully completed, completed, when you compare groups, you're excluding more of the most disabled people from the untreated group. And so this is an unfair comparison. You're going to attenuate differences across the groups if you exclude the incompleted tests. And so you have to have some way of trying to integrate this to uh, balance this out, because right now it's a biased sample if you only look at completed tests. Um, and this is an example. Here we're looking at the, the comparison of the uh, three groups, all nine tests, the crude, the raw scores, only looking at successfully completed tests. For all tests, the healthy controls are better than the two patient groups. But the differences between the untreated and treated controls are not significantly different except for two of the tests. However, if we do the same analysis, however, we code all incomplete tests as basement scores, as zeros. And remember, they're more dysfunctional, so it's not unreasonable to do so. So we have all the tests included. When you do that, the again, it's, of course, the healthy control the best. But there's only two tests in which the treated control and the untreated are not significantly different. So you get a lot more discrimination uh, uh, across the treated, comparing the treated control versus the untreated. And this, this is another element. In the uh, untreated patients, many of them are functioning quite poorly in the treated patients. So you get a lot of basement values. And, and so the, it is, the, especially in the patient groups, it's clearly non-normal, the distribution. So you have a couple of ways of dealing with this. Either you can transform it. This would probably use a logarithmic, a logarithmic transformation. But transformation doesn't really make it normal. Or you, in your multivariate analysis, you can do uh, analysis that are not sensitive to normality, so they can, uh, they can live with non-normal samples. And this, again, this is now a multivariate analysis comparing uh, the, the results of the spatial span test, which is where you click blocks, in where you exclude the only use successfully completed tests using generalized linear uh, least squares, or use Tobit analysis, which includes the incomplete tests by uh, censoring them. And in all of these tests, you see that these are uh, bolded. And so there's significant differences across the three groups, no matter how you do it. One in the total sample, and two in the educated and the undereducated. But, and also, age, gender, and years of schooling are also important in the total sample. But only education, only years of schooling, uh, remain significantly different or significantly related after you control other factors in the educated younger sample. So this is um, years of schooling is clearly the most important other factor beyond the group membership in the entire analysis. And this graph just shows the same thing. If you uh, exclude the incomplete test, the discrimination between untreated, this is in the low education group of the gold, discrimination between untreated and the treated control is not that great. But if you include the incomplete test in some way using, by using Tobit, for example, there's a much greater, the, the slope here is much greater. The discrimination between untreated and treated is much better. So what are the conclusions? Well, first, when assessing cognition using MCCB in undereducated older samples of individuals with schizophrenia, the method of administering each test in the badger needs to be revised to ensure that as many respondents as possible understand what is required before doing the test. Because you just read it, they don't understand what it's supposed to do. You're obviously not going to get a good test. In using these samples, test administrators must be trained to flexibly use instructions for each test based on an ongoing assessment of the respondent's comprehension of the test requirements. And after the administration of each test, classify each test result as incomplete or successful. And this is required, has a much higher demand on the uh, interviewers than the standard administration. But even after revising MCCB, studies with older, less educated respondents with schizophrenia will have relatively high rates of incomplete tests and high rates of successfully completed tests with basement values, that is, zero scores. But these issues can be dealt with by using alternative statistical methods to compare results between groups. Another issue is if you're using these older, um, undereducated samples, you have to have your own control, healthy control group. You can't compare them to the national co-normaling standards, which have uh, younger 
more educated people. You can't generate your T-scores or other things using the national standards. You have to have your own control group. Finally, an estimated 30 40 to 40 percent of all individuals with schizophrenia in the world with low levels of education or older age, many of whom live in rural areas of low and middle income countries, are currently excluded from most studies of cognition. These individuals are typically the most disabled and least able to access needed services. Making the additional effort to include these individuals in research about the course and management of the disorder is both a moral responsibility of researchers and has the potential of providing new insights about the disorder. For example, expanding the education range and the age range of persons assessed using the MCCB, the standard, the standard method of, using, of assessing cognition and schizophrenia, can address a sumber, several key issues in the field, like accelerated aging and combined combination of dementia with chronic schizophrenia. That obviously happened in the older age groups, and if you include them in your studies, you can assess this more, uh, in more detail. This remaining debate about neurodevelopmental versus neurodegenerative etiology of cognitive function schizophrenia, and including these samples will give us a better uh, uh, way to look at these problems. The role of cognitive reserve in persons with low levels of education who develop schizophrenia. Clearly, education is really a fundamental component of how cognition gets uh, developed, and the impact of schizophrenia, schizophrenia on individuals who have low education is clearly different than in people who have high education. And, and finally, the relationship of prolonged uh, duration of untreated psychosis and drug holidays to the trajectory of cognitive function in chronic schizophrenia, including these cohorts will help us look at this issue in um, a more detailed manner. Finally, further assessment of the psychometric characteristics of this revised method of administering MCCB is needed. Application of the method we developed to revise MCB in China for use in older, undereducated individuals with schizophrenia and other low and middle income countries is warranted. Thank you very much for your attention.